Hi, this is Elliot Fishman. Welcome to our latest set of uh, vodcasts. And this is going to be on hepatic masses. And I gave a talk in Rad AIM, and I just put together a new talk on hepatic masses, and I thought I would share it with you. And I looked back at what we've done lately, and we haven't done hepatic masses for a couple of years on CTSS, be it on our vodcasts or on our app. So let's take a look. Now, in many ways, looking at the liver hasn't changed. I always kind of use this slide, which makes the point that what we tried doing in 78, we do 40 years later. Look for the presence of disease, define the extent, determine its etiology, and help in patient management decisions. How do we manage the patient? What's important and what's not? Now, obviously, a lot has changed over those 40 years. We're much better at lesion detection, but one of the things I'll always emphasize is detecting more lesions does not mean a better diagnosis. Many of the lesions we pick up are these too small to classify. They're small cysts or hemangiomas or hamartomas, but you can imagine a patient with colon cancer, if all of a sudden you say there's a three millimeter something or other, and I can't rule out a MET, you go from stage one to stage four. So it's helpful to pick up lesions, but what's really helpful is to classify things. And we're gonna speak about that in detail because one of the things I think we can do very well is not just pick up lesions, but look at specific signatures. And one of the things I've always pushed is the fact that lesions commonly have signatures, not always, but most of the time, and we can do a lot by knowing the specific signatures. Now, of course, signatures also depend on protocol. And so for us, when we do dedicated liver, we're using water as an oral contrast material, and then we're using Omni or Visipake, usually between 100 and 120 ml, injecting at five cc's a second. Now, if radiation wasn't an issue, you might think about doing all sorts of phases, but radiation is an issue. Dedicated liver studies, we don't need non-contrast scans. We don't typically do late phase imaging, and we focus on arterial at about 30 seconds and venous at about 60 to 70 seconds. Occasionally, if you're uncertain as to a signature, a delayed scan might help. Increasing blush in a patient with cholangiocarcinoma, better filling in in a patient with hemangioma. But most of the time, between the arterial and venous, you're able to reach an answer or the later phase is not gonna help you anyway. So we can look at the liver many different ways from benign and malignant tumors to parenchymal disease to infectious disease perhaps, but in the interest of time, we're just gonna take a look at tumors. Now, one thing to start off with, I mentioned to you about the fact that one of the key things is looking at incidental findings. And incidental liver lesions, what do we do with them? Obviously, you know that it's a big difference between picking up an incidental lesion in a patient who had an MVA or has vague abdominal pain, or you're looking for polynephritis versus someone who has a newly diagnosed cancer, be it lung cancer, be it liver cancer, be it um, lung cancer. So what do you do? Well, there was this article in the ACR which looked at that, and you could see what it did, a kind of triage. Now, I didn't show you the old article from seven years earlier. That had like a thousand boxes. And this was kind of a good one, dividing lesions based on size, uh, under one CM, over one and a half, or one to one and a half. And then talking about the features. And you can see, regardless of the size, if there's good imaging features, you can stop. That's all. And in high-risk patients, if you pick up even high-risk patients under one CM, just wait, and then maybe then get an MR or a PCT. But you can see all of the various options. But again, it's very, very important to really understand how lesions do look. So let's take a look at that. If we look at the benign hepatic tumors, at the end of the day, it's kind of like giving a lecture on the spleen or a lecture on the kidney. Most renal lesions are not cancers, they're cysts. Most splenic lesions are in tumor, they're cysts, hemorrhagiomas, hematomas, And most hepatic lesions are not mets or hepatoma, but they're benign lesions, be it hepatic cysts or hemangiomas. And then we also have FNH and hepatic adenoma, although as we see, hepatic adenoma is typically considered a premalignant condition. 
But still, at the end of the day, it's benign lesions that we typically are going to see. And a lot of the lesions we pick up are cysts, small cystic lesions. This article by Barhani took a look at cystic lesions, divided them into four categories, developmental, inflammatory, neoplastic, and trauma-related. And of course, under those, in developmental, we talk about hepatic cysts and hematomas. That's the most common. Occasionally, you see a case of polycystic liver or corollis or a uh, foregut duplication cyst, but that is pretty rare. Inflammatory things are also pretty rare. We typically see abscesses in post-op patients or patients who had procedures. Amoebic abscess, depending where you are in the world, the same thing with hydatid abscesses. And of course, fungal microabscesses are typically immunosuppressed patients. We talk about neoplastic Biliary cyst adenoma, cyst adenocarcinoma is the classic one. Cystic liver mets, think about ovarian cancer, and cystic hepatoma. And finally, trauma-related. Hepatoma, biloma, seroma, but again, history there is usually very helpful in making the diagnosis. And of course, there are a whole range of unusual cystic lesions, including a pseudoaneurysm and a non-contrast scan, and perhaps a focal fat, which simulates a lesion but these are relatively uncommon. So let's go through all of them in some detail. Hepatic cysts, at least 10% of patients have hepatic cysts. The better the skin and the more cysts you pick up, particularly in older patients, but we know and we can see them, water density, well-defined, occasionally thin septations. Simple cysts do not enhance. They do not truly distort the vessels unless they're really super large. Yes, cysts can be symptomatic because something gets this big. Patients have pain because of capsular stretching, mass effect, and the like. So even a benign lesion can be problematic in terms of something will need to be done. Even large cysts like this one often don't create a whole lot of issue with the vasculature. Large cyst here, you had to look at the venous structures, very nicely seen. Occasionally with large cysts, you begin to have some difficulty, like if you look at this case, do you worry about the medial wall, the left side of the wall? Is there some enhancement there? Could I be dealing with some sort of cystic lesion? The lateral wall doesn't enhance. What's going on? Well, when you look at the MIP, and MIP is always going to be very helpful for you, you see that what happened was the cyst had mass effect, and the mass effect spread apart and splayed the hepatic artery. And so when you look at the MIP, you were seeing not the liver, but the hepatic artery being compressed. And so you, that's an important thing to recognize. So occasionally we can see vessel changes, but it's more mass effect, but you don't see neovascularity, you don't see irregularity. You see basically what you would expect with mass effect. Now, when you talk about cysts, we can talk about polycystic liver disease, can be multiple cysts, can replace the entire liver. As in this case, they can be small or they can be large. About half the patients with polycystic liver disease also have polycystic kidney disease. This patient had only polycystic liver disease. The uh, right kidney looks fine. There's no cyst present. Now, you can argue, can you be confused with cystic metastasis? Occasionally it's challenging, but I think in this case, there really is not going to be much of an issue. I mentioned half the patients or so with polycystic liver disease have polycystic kidney disease. This patient doesn't, but here's the other 50%. This patient does. Large kidneys bilaterally, multiple cysts, multiple cysts throughout the liver. Very classic polycystic kidney disease and polycystic liver disease. Now, I mentioned that most of the time cysts do not cause perfusion changes even when they're large, but if a cyst is located centrally and pushes on the IVC or really close to the takeoff of hepatic veins, you can have issues. This was a patient with a large cyst. This cyst had been drained a few times before and ended up having it drained a few times after. But you can see the mass effect based on location. You would worry about a cystic tumor if you didn't know better, and this was maybe my fifth scan looking at this patient. You can see what looks like questionable thickened wall, but look at all those perfusion changes in the right lobe of the liver. But that's going to be something you do see with hepatic cysts occasionally, and I wouldn't get 
too worried about it. So it's just something to recognize. And again, um, the uh, water density component, I also, in this case, could have thought of like an amoebic abscess. I'll show you amoebic abscess later, but that might be a good differential diagnosis. This case, you can argue what it is, but you see the liver edge, you see the little clips, this patient had surgery. This could be an old hematoma or biloma. This was a biloma. When you have cystic mets, and again, this case is easy because there are lesions that are not cystic and it's metastatic carcinoid, but you can see that at first glance, you can think about a cyst if I only thought about the large lesion, but you look at the model density centrally, you look at the apparent wall thickening, it's not just a wall and vessel splayed, it's thickening of the wall. That's gonna be highly suspicious for tumor. Or this case with sarcoma metastatic to the liver, you see the cystic lesion, you see dense calcification, you see the model nature of the lesion. Then you see as you go to venous, you have all these stretched vessels via the um, hepatic artery, and the wall is irregular. It's not what you're looking at here is a MIP. The regularity of the wall, the thickening, the abnormal enhancement, the abnormal vessels, and here it is delayed. This is not going to be an issue. You can argue, could this be an abscess? I don't think so, but this is gonna be a tumor, and indeed, that's what it was. Now, you could argue also, could this be a primary tumor? Occasionally, we will see cystic hepatomas, and occasionally, we will see cystic cholangiocarcinomas. Another example, what about this? Is this a simple cyst? There's model density in it. That looks a little bit weird. You see the vessels have kind of stretched. You know, what exactly is going on? Um, this is metastatic disease. And this is going to be metastasis from a gist tumor. Remember I mentioned gist tumors can be very cystic. When you look hard at the liver met, you can see the wall thickening. It can be subtle because only part of the wall may be visualized. Of course, you then look down and there's a mass in the pelvis. That's the patient's small bowel gist tumor, which is exophytic, very nicely shown there. Now again, small bowel gist tumor metastatic to liver. Again, large cystic liver lesion, high density, maybe there was some bleed into it. But what's going on here? You can see the cystic nature of the patient's tumor. Now, under the rare things, this case, you know, is not a simple cyst because look at the perfusion changes right lobe of liver. So one thing and word of advice I give is make sure you scan the times I gave you. If you scan late, even things like this might become isodense. You don't want to miss these things, so you need to scan early enough. And here you see the perfusion changes. This patient was local in Baltimore but had traveled, and this was um, a case of hydatid disease. Very, very rare for us to see that. Now, I do make the point also that sometimes it's hard without a history, looking only at the films, to say what something is. Could this be a MET? Absolutely. This patient did have a pancreatic cancer. This metastatic, four weeks post-surgery, that would be terrible. Is What else could this be? Well, it's this ring. This was an abscess. So post-operative abscesses can fool you, particularly if they're a few weeks or even a few months out because you're suspecting tumor, not abscesses. Obviously, you have fluid and air bubbles. That's not very difficult. Now, when you talk about cystic lesions, I mentioned biliary cyst adenomas and cyst adenocarcinomas, how it kind of is in that category of um, lesions which are going to be considered malignant. We also talk about cystic lesions, multiple abscesses, a clinical cyst, hematoma, biloma, polycystic kidney fit in that category as well. So let's look at a few things. Biliary cyst adenomas. As I mentioned, we used to spend a lot of time distinguishing or trying to cyst adenoma versus cyst adenocarcinoma based on the presence of enhancement, but, but especially nodularity. Now we kind of know this tumor, which is in middle-aged females, can transform into a biliary cyst adenocarcinoma, and so these patients will get the lesion resected. Okay, you'll do, you know, you have to resect the lesion. It's the only way to cure the patient. And the appearance is cystic lesions, septations, smooth margins, maybe calcification. Here's an example. 
nice septations. The only thing I could have thought of here would have been a hydatid cyst. Patient no foreign travel. Another one. You see the septations kind of has that hydatid cyst look. Here it is again, very nicely shown. Sometimes you can get fooled. This was read as the gallbladder originally, and you can see the gallbladder uh, is going to be nearby, but that's just a uh, that's just a very nice example of a cystic hepatic lesion. There it is again, just hanging off the liver, and again. Now we talk also about how difficult the diagnosis could be. If you look at this case and only these images, at first glance you think that cystic lesion at 9 o'clock is going to end up being a descended gallbladder. But then you realize, you see the gallbladder next to it, and then you realize that it has septations, and when you look at coronal view, it's very clear what's gallbladder and what's not gallbladder. This was a biliary cyst adenoma. So again, it can confuse you depending where it originates, but a very classic appearance, okay? Very, very good appearance. Now what else? Hepatic is a very easy diagnosis most of the time. Sometimes it's not easy. We talk about hemangiomas and giant hemangiomas, giant being over five. In my experience, the more difficult ones are the two to three centimeter region, not the greater than five. Greater than five, we routinely see puddling at the edge of the lesion, central scarring, very nicely shown, and that puddling leads to the lesion filling in over time. Central scars used to be defined for FNH, but you can see one here. Hepatoma can have central scars. Hepatic adenomas can have central scars. Hemangiomas, and the most classic, of course, is FNH. But beautiful example of the puddling the cavernous, the, the changes in the wall of the uh, hemangioma. You sometimes could see vessels feeding, but the vessels are not irregular. Nicely shown again, the puddling, and this is MIP imaging, so if you think about a, the hemangioma being round, it projects everything in one direction, which is why it looks like such perfect, uh, perfect coverage. And again, nice examples here of hemangioma, you see the puddling very nicely. And as you scan later on, you can see how the puddling increases. And that's very, very classic for hemangiomas. Things need to increase. If you just see it early and it doesn't fill in, that's a problem. In the old days, we required it to fill in. We don't anymore, but it, we really rely on the early phase with the peripheral enhancement and the um, the filling in over time. So very, very important. Another example, large lesion over 13 centimeters. There's a second lesion, hemangiomas are often multiple. Look at the puddling and now the filling in over time. Now, you don't need to fill in 100%. We used to require like 75 and 90%, but to me, you know when it's filling in because you go over early phase imaging. So. Uh, that becomes very important, and again, just a very nice example on the MIP imaging. Another hemangioma, could it be a sarcoma? Could it be hepatoma? Hepatomas can enhance, but not that peripheral rim enhancement with a puddling configuration, which shows well here also. Very, very nice example. Here it is again a little bit later. And here it is again a little bit later, and now you can see the lesions filling in. As I mentioned, we used to wait till it filled in in its entirety. We're not going to wait anymore, but it's just a really nice example showing you those findings. A small lesion, 3CM, same thing, puddling in the periphery. Uh, you can see a feeding vessel. It's not uncommon to see feeding vessels. Okay, that's not rare. Also, you can see in this case, there are two hemangiomas. That also was not going to be rare. Here it is again, the same patient, puddling. And you can see the feeding vessel. And if you look, there's sort of the classic appearance of filling in, how we fill in over time. At times, hemangiomas are very classic, but every once in a while you get fooled. This patient was supposed to have a gist tumor. And there's a lesion coming up the stomach. Looks like a classic gist tumor. But in the coronal, what I didn't notice was that lesion is not off the stomach, though it might be, but it's really coming off the left lobe of the liver. And I should have recognized that because that when we got venous phase, there was puddling. And I said, oh, what an unusual appearance for 
a gist tumor. It wasn't a gist tumor, it was hemangioma. I looked up the follow-up and said, a hemangioma, I called pathologist and said, you made a mistake, it was a gist. They go, no, you made a mistake. And that really is nicely the point. I've seen a few cases like that, it's very tricky. Now, a few other comments. Sometimes the smaller hemangiomas are more difficult. Hemangiomas can be very vascular and you can see perfusion changes. And at times, if you had a neuroendocrine tumor, one could argue, can I be certain it's not neuroendocrine METS versus hemangioma? Usually you can, again, uh, peripheral to central filling in, small vessel leading up to it. I've been looking at these perfusion changes as a way of recognizing lesions, particularly benign versus malignant, when they're too small to classify and things like the vessel flow. Here you see I'm showing you the small feeding vessel to the hemangioma, but then you see the puddling around it, and I'll show you a cinematic rendering. See how nicely I can accentuate the flow-related changes around the tumor? That's a very good sign. Now, many things can cause flow-related changes, but this is just a really nice example of a hemangioma that did that. Finally, I'll just mention the most difficult hemangiomas to me are the small ones. Here's a ring-like lesion. Could this be a met, the patient had malignancy? Well, you can't see hemangiomas that are perfectly round, and so this indeed was the case. So this was hemangioma. So let's talk about some other lesions, but before we do that, let's take a little bit of a break, and we'll come back and get started again. Be right back. If you liked what you heard here today, please make sure to hit that subscribe button and visit our website, ctss.com, for lectures, quizzes, pearls, and more. Also, be sure to check out our apps that are available for free on the Apple Store. All links are in the description box below.